You better watch out. You better not cry. You better not part. I'm telling you, I'm telling you why. That's right. Santa Claus, well, and then I cannot hit those notes, so I'm gonna change the, the key, okay? He sees when you are sleeping, he knows when you are awake, you know when you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. I guess that some of the, the children could have been thinking, oh my goodness, why is the man singing? And maybe a mom could say, is it what you call it? Please ask him to stop singing. But let me tell you, what really catch me are the last two lines of that Christmas carol. He knows when you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. That's the way it works in the world, the, the world around us. Uh, you find evidence of that in almost every aspect of your life. For example, the athlete makes it to the varsity team because it's really good. He has been practicing over and over. And the student gets the highest grades because the first, that student has been studying on a daily basis, have been dedicated to study. The employee gets the, pay, the paycheck and bonus because the person is doing his or her work very well. What about the, the applicant to law school? Well, he gets in because uh, of the LSAT scores and the grades as well. For example, the applicant for a job gets the position because of the qualifications. Thank you. And the children at Christmas, they get their gift because they are good enough. It's just the way it works in the world around us. And it's a way it ought to, to work in most every circumstance we can think of. But, when, but then we come to Christmas. And at the same time, we come to the Advent season. Advent, but we are very related to that. The Advent, in the Advent season, we are celebrating, celebrating the, the Advent of Jesus Christ, the first Advent. And suddenly, I have a concern. And suddenly, I have a fear. I have a fear that our singing of the Christmas carols are taking in of the realities of the Christian uh, Christmas celebrations around us might somehow leak over into our understanding on the, of the Advent. And that, might, and, and that we might actually begin to think that the manger happened because we were good enough. Nothing could be further from the truth. In, the, in, in fact, the Advent season, if it is about anything at all, is about one word, grace. Amen. I want to invite you to take your Bibles and open uh, the Bibles in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I, if you have studied 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9, you would think this is a not place, an unusual text to go to form a thought about Advent. Let me give you some background about those two chapters, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. Paul is on a mission. He is in a, on a mission to raise funds for the needy brethren, I mean, the believers in Jerusalem. It takes actually that mission, that project, that initiative, took around 10 years out of his life, a whole decade. He spent his time talking to other churches, asking them to contribute to the collection to Jerusalem. In fact, he asked the Corinthians in, the first, in his first letter to collaborate. And they apparently responded positively, positively, but somewhere after that, 
they kind of stopped giving. Paul sent Titus then to uh, the Corinthians to encourage them, to encourage their giving, and that helped some. But then he started to hear that there were other missionaries that were coming from other parts or other regions who were coming in among them trying to take away their offerings. And apparently they were filling their pockets with those offerings. So Paul wrote in his second letter, this letter, 2 Corinthians, a very pointed and very interesting statement about giving. It, it takes up two chapters, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, which is the longest statement anywhere in Paul's writings on the facet of Christian life called given, that sometimes we call stewardship. In these chapters, Paul is urging, encouraging his friends and brothers and sisters in different areas of the, the you know, the word that, that he was preaching, including uh, the Corinthians, encouraging them to keep up the giving. The text we are going to read is a text right out of Paul's offering call. Now Paul meant it as a reason for giving. But I want to turn to the text and think of it as an explanation of why it is that God has acted in our behalf. Maybe this text will give us an insight into why Jesus came to the manger. Just one verse long. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Paul's offering call and the reason for a manger. And this is what it says. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that he, through his poverty might, might become rich. Let's read it again. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Paul began by saying, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace. A very common word, isn't it? We use, we, we use it quite often in the church world. If we go outside this environment, we might not listen to that word very commonly, but in, in church, in the church world, we listen to that and we use it very commonly, frequently, very often. In fact, I would guess that if you come to church at any, at any moment, you will hear the word grace more, more than once in church. Maybe during a prayer, during a scripture reading, maybe in a psalm, or maybe just a, during a conversation, a Bible study, during a the Sabbath school lesson. But somewhere along the line, somebody will say something about grace. Because grace is just this, that central to the life of Christ. You may, you may have heard it already here this morning. Well, I have repeated it several times. But I, I, I wouldn't doubt that you heard it before during this morning. Maybe the most succinct statement of salvation in all Paul's writings contains grace as its central word, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And it says, for it, by, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. So if th that word is so central to the life of, of Christ, what is grace? You tell me, what is grace? Do you have, any of you have a definition for that word? Or at least an idea, or maybe a line that describes the word grace? Ooh, who said that? Ooh, yeah. Very good. That 
is very interesting that you mentioned that, that actual uh, phrase. Certainly we must have some kind of definition. I remember that a number of years ago, this event or experience occurred actually on, in April of two, the year 2000, more than 17 years ago. I was moving from Washington DC to Pennsylvania to work with a new company. A new company who bought another company. It was like, it was a consolidation between two companies, but one was more powerful, and now it was buying US healthcare. And they needed more people to work in that organization. So I had the opportunity to move from Kaiser Permanente Health Plan in Washington DC to Aetna US Healthcare, the new company in Pennsylvania. And it was during my orientation week. You know that when you get into a new position in a new place, you have to have an orientation week. Some, some people have more than a, an orientation week, a month of orientation. In my case, I was starting that orientation, and all of a sudden, my new boss asked me to meet with me, and asked me, Augusto, I would like you to come to my office now. He said, well, that is uh, very good, hopefully, because I'm starting, so I have not done anything bad yet. So I went, I went there, and she had, a flight ticket. He said, tomorrow you're going to the other headquarters facilities in Hartford, Connecticut. And these are, and, and this is your flight, your flight ticket. He said, what? Fantastic. I was excited. He said, you're going to, to meet new executives that have been recruited across the country and they want to meet you as well. So, you know, I received that, that uh, new with a lot of excitement. I didn't ask for that. I had not done anything to receive that opportunity because I had been there for just a couple of days oriented. Knowing that I was so terrified and still of height, immediately I checked the, the ticket, and I noticed something very interesting. It was not a ticket to take a commercial flight to Connecticut. It was a ticket to fly in a helicopter. And he said to me, oh my, am I going to get in a helicopter to travel from Pennsylvania to Connecticut? Hours and hours of, of you know, of travel, or traveling. Oh my goodness. What kind of evil, conniving person would that, it would do something like this to someone who is terrified of height. But I just arrived there and I didn't want to, you know, tell my, my boss, I, I, I cannot go. This is an opportunity. Uh, so I just decided to go. I remember that that night I didn't sleep. I left, yeah, I had to be at five in that heliport, small one in the campus of Edna US Healthcare. And I was thinking about, my goodness, I'm going to get there in that tiny aircraft that is moving. I can't imagine, I was imagining that the winds were moving that aircraft back and forth and I was getting terrified. I arrived at four to the gate, a little gate that looked actually like a waiting, uh, like a waiting uh, room in a doctor's office, very small. And I thought that, you know, the, the actual helicopter was going to be that small as well. When I arrived, there was a lady very well dressed and three individuals, male, with it all dressed up, waiting there. And I had the opportunity to meet them immediately and to meet each other. And I became aware that one was the senior vice president of human resources, the lady, and the three other guys were the attorneys 
uh, general account, uh, legal counsels uh, of the company. Just half an hour later, the aircraft arrived. Well, for my surprise, it was not a tiny helicopter. It was a huge aircraft. And immediately after, we started the process, we proceeded to board the aircraft. When I got inside, and I saw the exquisite, exquisite decor, and I got in that big reclining leather seat, and I noticed that we were only five people with one flight attendant for us, and that we have a list of snacks and drinks that looks very, very attra attractive to me. I felt, I started changing my, my concern about not being flying in a commercial jet. And let me tell you, that was very stable. It was large, very comfortable. And I started uh, to, to try to look outside the, 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 the helicopter and it was very dark still, but I had the opportunity to see the sunrise, which, which was beautiful. And then a lot of uh, breathtaking landscapes. But after a while, I decided to take a nap. I have not been able to, to sleep because I was nervous. I was getting really, really concerned. But now I decided to take a nap because the other guys were taking naps as well. So I didn't, you know, I, I was not going to feel really guilty by doing this. I took a nap 30 minutes. And after that, when I woke up, I noticed that we were flying over water. I said, wow, so where we are now? But I looked very, you know, with more uh, focus, I noticed that we were flying close to the Statue of Liberty. We were in, we're flying over New, the New York Bay. And he said, wow, what are we doing here? Unfortunately, by, by that time, we didn't have smartphones. I would have uh, shot a, a video there, but I couldn't. I, memory fails. But I kind of remember that I called somebody from that aircraft. I do not know if it was my mother, she doesn't remember actually, neither I asked her, or if it was my, my sister, but I, I called somebody because I was so excited about the opportunity. And we ended up 10 minutes later landing by the, the World Trade Center, the Twin Towers, two blocks from them. Really, Impressive. Can you imagine? At this moment, I was living the life. A once in a lifetime experience. I didn't ask for it. I did not pay for that. I did not earn it. I did not, I did not even deserve it because deserve it in my orientation. And yet, I received the best treatment you can imagine. There is a word for that. And the word is grace. What is grace? Being treated far better than what you deserve to be treated. I mean, and being treated in that fashion, not because you earned it, or you deserve it, or because you've paid for that. No wonder theologians say that a wonderful definition of grace are the words of merited favor. That is correct. I went to a Bible dictionary looking for another definition of grace, and there was a quiet an entry trying to explain what grace was. But in the first line, in the first sentence, two words, I found two words that are key to its definition. Unearned, undeserved. That's grace. And Paul writes and says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you, do you want to know why, why there was a manger? Do you want to know why there was a babe, a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes who, laid, who was laid in that manger? Do you want to know why the angels sang? Why the shepherds wondered? Why the wise men uh, came? Why any of that occurred? One word, one word grace. For you know the grace of Jesus Christ. 
But Paul doesn't finish the verse there. He adds something after that. He says that though he was rich, yet he beca became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. So it's a riches to rags uh, and rags to riches tale. Is it it? That though he was rich, it seems that Paul is reaching back in, into the midst of the etern eternity past to the pre-existent Christ, the Lord and creator of the universe, the wealth of eternity, the splendor, the might, the power of being the creative sovereign, all at his back and call. Though he was rich, yet said, Paul said, yet he became poor. I read in one occasion that the original word can be translated as abject poverty. One Bible commentary said, said it this way, to become a beggar. In other words, he went from the pinnacle to the pit. The pit, a manger. A cross, a tomb, why? Grace, his grace. And remember that Paul is talking about this, writing about this as an impetus, as an incentive, a motivation for them to give. That was his purpose. But as we read this, we recognize within that the story of Christmas. We do not find any hints here of anything that says, you better wash out, you better not cry, you better not pout, or I will tell you why. He knows if you have been sleepy, he knows when you are, you're awake, he knows if you're been bad or good, so be good. For goodness sake, none of, the, of that there, just grace undeserved, unmerited grace. Do you understand how central is grace for the Christian gospel? How is that reality called grace that central for what we believe? Philip Yancey, a prominent American Christian author, writing in his book, what is so amazing about grace Record these words, and I read. During a British conference on comparative religions, experts, experts from around the world debated what? If any belief was unique to Christian faith, they began eliminating possibilities. Was it the incarnation? Other religions have another version of God's appearing in human forms. Was it the re resurrection? Other religions have accounts of returns from death. The debate went off for some time until C.S. Lewis, you know who, is this, who this guy is, wandered into the room. What is the rumpus about it? He asked and heard in reply, that his colleagues were discussing Christianity's, or Christianity's unique contribution among world religions. Louis responded, oh, that's easy, grace. After some discussion, the conferees had to agree. Yancey continues writing and says, the notion of God's love coming us free of charge no strings attached, seems to go against every instinct of humanity. The Buddhist Eightfold Path, the Hindu doctrine of karma, the Jewish covenant, and the Muslim code of law, each of these offers a way to earn approval. Only Christianity dares to make God's love unconditional. Isn't it beautiful? Grace is the whole journey. 
The second Corinthians 8, 9, the one that we just read, says that it was grace who brought Jesus from heaven to us. And Ephesians 2, 8, says that we are saved by grace. So grace is the one who takes us to Him, back to Him, to heaven. It's grace to every step of the way. Grace that we cannot earn, that we cannot buy, that we cannot deserve. Grace which nothing, that nothing can be added, even if we try. Because we do. Unconsciously, we want to, we try to be good. We, we, we try to, to win the, to win or to get or to earn the acceptance of God. Make no mistake about it. Grace is that reality to which we add nothing. That we do not deserve that we can never earn is a gift, gift that God gives. The question is, can you consider that? Can you consider that in your, in your mind? Knowing the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Is that something that you will be able to accept without trying to tip God with your works? Grace. It was the great British preacher Charles Hutt Spurgeon, do you remember that guy? Who preached about grace. And I want you to listen to, this, to his words for a moment. It says, they are beautiful. The bridge of grace will bear you, uh, bear your weight, brother. It will bear your weight, sister. Thous thousands of big sinners have gone across that bridge. Tens, tens of thousands have gone over it. So I, some have been the chief of sinners, and some have come at the very last of their, of their days. But the arch has never yielded beneath their weight. I will go with them trusting to the same support. It will burn me over as it has for them. That is what the Lord has provided, the bridge that can bear all our sins. Do you want to know the reason for the major? The mechanism that moves, moves Christ off of the throne into the human flesh. Look no further than the word grace, of merited favor. All the, rich, the riches of heaven given in one gift, grace. In one occasion in, 19, in 2011, Pastor Rob, uh, Randy Roberts, have you, have you seen, do you know who is Pastor Randy Roberts? Is the pastor, the senior pastor of Omelinda University Church. He was telling story about an experience that he had when he visited London, England. He went to the Tower of London, and after you know visiting different areas of the tower, he ended up going to see uh, the crown jewels of the throne. Stunning display. Every kind of precious stones imaginable, including emeralds, rubies, diamonds, sapphires, crowns, scepters, and necklaces. Really impressive. And some of those jewels are very, very expensive as well. Take, for example, one of them, by no means the only one, the, Cul the Cullinan Diamond, better known as the Great Star of Africa. It is the largest gem quality rough diamond ever found, weighing 3,106 carats. It's worth over $2 billion. 
Pastor Randy Roberts went to one of the guards who were there and to ask, to, to ask the guy a question. He acknowledges after the fact that it was not a good idea to ask that question. He calls it stupid question. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it, but this is how he calls it. So how much does the insurance for all these gems cost? That was not the actual question. The guard was not very happy. He, he looked Pastor Randy Roberts as he would come from California. And the guard said, insurance, are you kidding? We cannot even estimate the value of what is here. There is no insurance company in the world that can insure these gems. Pastor Roberts walked off humbled while the two guards there were just making fun of him. The pastor said, wow, that was a bad idea. But while he was trying to leave the place, he was walking to the exit, he noticed that there was another display there, but this display looked like a container. And it had a sign beside it that said, if you wish to donate to the upkeep of the tower, it will be appreciated. Appreci appreciated. My goodness. He said, what? They just told me that there is no way to value all this, and now they are asking for a tip. Completely different to the reality of the Christian life. I want you to, I want to take you to a little tour now. The tour of a stable in Bethlehem. I have to warn you, there is mud there, dirt. You might have to walk over mud and dirt. And there you will see the cows. And there are the donkeys. And in here are the camels. You you might you know hold your breath or just you know try to be careful, hold your nose because the, the fragrance is not very good. But I want you to enter to the actual stable, the cave that is behind that part here where the, the, the animals are. And see right there. I want you to look right over there. I want you to look at the manger, which has some hay on it. I want to get close to it and look to the all to see all the riches of heaven there. That baby. Everything you need is in that gift, in that baby. Everything that you need to deal with in the past is there. Anything that you need to deal with your present or the future is there as well. Everything you need for the forgiveness, forgiveness of your sins, the salvation of your soul, is there. Everything you need for growth and maturity is there. All the riches of heaven. Heaven has just poured itself out all in one gift at a manger in Bethlehem. All the riches of heaven are given to you because of, of a magnificent, marvelous, amazing reality called grace.
thank you very much for the opportunity of sharing your word this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the, the tremendous, incredibly impossible to describe gift that you have, you have provided us, grace. Grace through your beautiful son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Today, that we have been meditating in that gift, we ask you that now that we are going home, that we continue thinking, meditating in that tremendous present, the greatest present that any could give, salvation through grace. Thank you, Lord, and come, come soon. We want you to be with us forever, and we want to be with you in heaven forever. In the name of Jesus, amen.